Okay, uh, let's get started on the October 20 Finance and Administration um, meeting. We have Fred joining us via Zoom, um, and Bob should be here soon. If we can begin with the manager report. Sure, uh, thank you, Councilmember Rickard. So, uh, you know, we'll go into a little bit of detail here, and Council will have just a general summary. Uh, so, Mainline Greenway, um, I have a meeting on Friday to uh, continue to work on that. There's also going to be a demonstration ride on uh, this Sunday. Uh, I believe it's going to start, oh, I forget, I think it's in the weekly email, either at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock uh, over near uh, the, um, over near uh, Bella Kenwood. Um, so anyway, that will be happening this Sunday. I do believe some line markings, some temporary line markings have been put down in preparation for that event on, on Sunday, which we'll be going through uh, the borough. Um, we are still waiting to hear back on the county transportation grant. Uh, as we talked about before, the Haverford Ave uh, project has been put off till next spring due to material and supply uh, issues. Um, I am working on the budget. Uh, my thanks to council uh, you know, for taking the time to go through the budget uh, overview with me at our last meeting and uh, at the work session on November 3rd. I will have the um, an actual budget document for folks to look at. Uh, in addition, uh, the borough traffic engineer is working on plans for the bike pilot, which will actually be presented first to infrastructure uh, next week, and then uh, depending on how that conversation goes, hopefully then to uh, council on the third. Uh, you know, as usual, the borough offices are completely open, uh, masks are required, and the multi-purpose room and this room here at 100 Conway are available for uh, private rental. Um, we have received a lot of uh, comments from borough residents regarding the recent uh, street light, LED street light installation. Um, myself and our lighting consultant are working through those um, concerns and um, should have some ideas uh, you know, for potential solutions for residents. It's going to be kind of a case-by-case -case basis. There's no one-size-fits-all solution for every situation. Uh, so we're going to work on evaluating and, and getting that figured out. Yeah. And just as a side note, too, and not that the lights are squarely now in that infrastructure stage, but the feedback that I've heard from community members really is complementing the communication between the office and residents, which you know clearly falls under the communication plan of FNA. So thanks for that. Yeah, I'm um, glad to hear that. I'm hearing lots of, I can walk my dog, I can see at night, this is safe. I know there's been some concerns, but overwhelmingly the comments and the feedback I'm hearing is the office has been so responsive. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and then finally, um, borough offices are going to be closed on November 2nd for Election Day and then November 11th for uh, Veterans Day. Great. Thanks. Um, do you want to do, do the brief borough treasurer report for here, for sure. FNA? Absolutely. So, I mean, generally it's still uh, pretty good news as of uh, September for the, um, for the borough. Um, the general fund in particular, I mean, even, even not factoring in the one-time uh, ARPA money that we got from the federal government uh, shows, you know, pretty uh, sizable surplus uh, for this year. Um, overall, the general fund is looking at a, a net gain of uh, $445,000 for this year, about half of which is the um, ARPA money. And then just overall, I mean, a lot of revenue sources are up. We've had a lot, lot of one-time expense savings from borough uh, staffing. Um, and, um, you know, so that's good news. I mean, in particular, our transfer tax is doing very well. These figures are as of, um, September 30th, but we did get our October payment last week, which was another uh, $40,000 in transfer tax. So, um, you know, I'm looking at the year that we're going to bring in about 230000 in transfer tax, which might be the most the borough has ever uh, brought in for that revenue source. And then we were unable to anticipate at this time what the new taxes will bring from the three apartmental apartment complexes that are coming in 2022. I mean, right. 
Yeah, I um, I've tried to do, I've tried to kind of work on a little bit of a guess for that for the 2022 budget, but also when projecting revenue, I like to be kind of conservative with that. Um, in prior employment, I've seen construction projects hit delays or just, yeah. you know, things happen and then suddenly um, you're counting on that revenue and you don't have it. Um, so I do have, I am factoring into the 2022 budget right now, 114 for us, because that's very far along. Um, I'm not factoring in uh, the projects on Haverford or, um, or 650 Montgomery at this time. So if, we, so if they do, if those do get completed next year to a place where they get reassessed, that would kind of be like, you know, bonus Absolutely. money next year for us. And that, um, that's very briefly the treasury yeah. report. Fred, any questions, comments? Nope. Great. Um, okay, PA House Bill 1694. Um, actually, if, um, if you could actually take the lead on that yeah. one. You know what, I'm gonna pull up, I'm sorry, I should pull this up. This is in response to, I'm sorry, Rick Trolley's. And of course, I can't find it right now. Um, request to us to sign on and send our support. Um, Rick Trolley sent to us, he learned about PA Bill 1694, which would, can be considered this fall. Um, and he summarizes it, it really kind of um, expands the protections from lawsuits against friends and groups or volunteer organizations. And I really would be interested in um, John Walco. I know that there is um, a lawsuit in a Pennsylvania nearby borough where there was um, kind of a an Oktoberfest music fest where a historical society kind of went on as the sponsoring group. Um, are you familiar with this? Oh, oh okay. Sorry. Um, uh, and there was there was volunteers that were held liable, and that group was held liable on that. So I would really. Um, at least kind of get the consideration of others. If this is something as council, we want to support any legislation that supports our volunteers and our nonprofit orgs, particularly given our events in the borough are resurfacing. And while I think that we certainly have done our due diligence in requiring insurance and we've protected the borough more than we ever have, I also wanted to explore any options that would protect volunteers or groups. Um, I mean, any, I'll yeah. go to you and Michelle first and then ask Fred on Zoom. Sure, I mean, I think that, I think that makes a lot of sense. If it's, if fall or harsh that the borough council do a resolution and support, that's pretty uh, minimal effort for, you know, pretty possible maximal gain for our volunteers. Okay. Michelle, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, would that? that be part of our liability insurance? Would that be an extension of it? Or? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if that adds any liability to us or rather just protects the groups. Right. That'd be a great thing to ask, uh, you know, John Walco if the committee wants to pursue it. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, Fred, do you have any questions? No, I mean, given how many, you know, volunteer groups we have here in Narberth that are working on, you know, like Friends of Saline or, uh, you know, any, any NAA, I mean, we have, we have a long history of working with a number of groups, so it, it seems like a, a good idea to protect them from frivolous lawsuits. Okay. Um, and we can, so, I mean, I, I'm, just, I, I'm in favor of this based on what I see. Okay. And, and really, it's just providing a letter to um, Representative Daly encouraging her to support this. So, right, right. It would be our expression of support for this bill, which is currently in the, in the assembly. Correct. Um, so, that is something that I would like to have a discussion with tonight, though, because it is on the docket for the fall, so we should send that. We should we should request that sooner than later. Uh, okay. Okay. Then I will share with the group that we are in support of this. Okay. Um, switching back to Michelle. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so I have been uh, researching with other um, management over the years, different types of work order, permitting systems. Um, we have a system that I've heard is much better than no system that we had at one point. Um, but it, it's been clear that 
there needs to be something that organization communication um, is shared immediately throughout the department. Um, so I came across a few demos, and this one in particular, my dog, has really hit all those spots where I feel like we've been lacking. Um, so it's multi point, um, so it's work order systems, code enforcement, permitting, and then it does have the option to expand into more of a GIS kind of, um, you know, kind of tracker, kind of incorporate some of the ArcGIS data that we have currently that we don't have, you know, use for and map it um, into one program. Um, so what the system can do is um, people, residents can submit work orders or code enforcement complaints to the office either by doing a form online or submitting a regular form in the office. So they, they still have the option to submit a paper copy, um, but can also submit a form directly on the, the portal. That form then gets transferred, depending on what the work order or code enforcement issue is about, to the correct department. So at that point, everyone can see the status, that it was submitted, what it was submitted for, and where it is. It's including the resident. Including the resident, if they make an account. Got it. They could also call and say, hey, I submitted this work order, what's the status? And instead of staff members, office, office manager, having to go back, okay, well, it was submitted to code enforcement officer, now I have to contact them, we can see in real time where we are. We can also see, um, we can integrate all of our permitting and all of the data that we already have into the system, so we have a full record. So if we have any violations on a um, certain road or for a house, um, for whatever reason, and they try to um, submit a permit application, we'll be able to see when we pull up that address, okay, well, we may not want be able to accept this permit application because there's outstanding violations. So it really connects everything in a way that staff can easily maneuver and manage it as, as well as communicate to the public, this is how you can do it, but you can still have the option to do it the way you had before. The fact that you all were able to connect those pieces and make it some sort of efficient process is, is amazing. So it makes perfect sense that this software package begins. Can I ask, what's the yearly um, software subscription? It's $13,000. And then there's a $4,000 implementation fee. Um, not that I would ask you to calculate this, but if you were to calculate operational cost to connecting all of those dots and times on the phone, I have to imagine it's more than $17,000. Yeah, and not only that, I mean, the borough, um, I think the borough, and my credit to Michelle on this, I mean, I, I want to say, like, she's pretty much done, like, you know, 98% of the work on this, and I think it's really fantastic what she's uh, found for us here. Um, you know, not only that, but like Michelle said, on the enforcement side as well, I think it'll allow us, um, especially if we're talking about doing things in the future, like sidewalk inspection or rental inspection or commercial fire inspection, it'll allow us as we kind of grow that as well to really keep a handle on it and really manage things in a way we wouldn't be able to without a software tool like this. Michelle, can you, uh, when we used to have C-Click Fix, which was not a match apparently for the pro, you could upload actually a picture to say mm -hmm. if you were, or, or do residents have the capability yep. as well? Yes, they can explain um, the address of the issue, an explanation of what the issue is, and then upload a, fi a photo and submit it. And like I said, depending on, you know, they have options of, you know, code enforcement, um, overgrown vegetation, here, I'm gonna click this one. So then it automatically goes to, code enforcement for that. Um, and then code enforcement at that point can say, hey, I'm not gonna be in the borough, I'm gonna send that to Public Works. Public Works get it, gets it as a work order. And then they can submit, you know, here's the photos that we saw, here's the deadline, here's who we contacted at what time, here is, you know, the date that they have to make those adjustments, um, otherwise the violation gets sent, and then it really keeps step, track by track. Um, so, I mean, it's good, a liability, you know. Amazing. Um, Fred, any questions or comments? Yeah, so, you know, people lament the the, uh, <laughs> the loss of C-Click Fix. I mean, I see people saying, oh, it was great while we had it. Uh, I think that there's a lot of um, interest in 
you know, uh, in the community for something like this. I think it would, you know, it would provide more transparency and let them see, you know, the status of their, you know, submit a request online, see the status of their request. These are things that people um, have asked to do. I mean, they, they want this. It fills, fulfills some of our comprehensive planning goals. Um, got a, a comprehensive planning goal to create a digital platform for incident reporting and real-time tracking of infrastructure projects in the borough, including road repairs, road closures, and utility needs, which sounds like uh, this, this fits the bill. Yep. So uh, it, it sounds like a, a big upgrade to institutional capacity and one that um, people have been asking for. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. When do you see the, the date that you would adopt and implement? Uh, I would view implementation as being uh, January of 2022. I would want council to um, approve it as part of the 2022 budget, and uh, we could then allocate the 17000 for next year uh, in there and, uh, and get it going. That's great. Michelle, thank you for researching this. Well, thank uh, you for researching it. Point that is really responding to a huge need of frustration, I think, of neighbors of not understanding how, where, um, you know, complaints or issues can be monitored. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm wondering since we can, uh, we don't have John Walco quite yet. So can we can we skip to the PFM debt proposal? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a good thing you uh, came over. <laughs> yeah, answer, thank uh, you. Uh, no, answer, please. Uh, or check. No, you can. No, you can come up. Uh, Still blowing in the 360 camera. Yeah. yeah still blown away by that. So. Well, uh, I'll get your uh, presentation up on the TV screen here. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yes, just a quick introduction for everyone. I'm sorry, because um, I always deal with everyone's first name over at PFM. What is your last name? Uh, Bamber, B A M B U. Yep. We have uh, Chris Bamber here with us tonight from Public Financial Management. This is the consultant that I've been uh, working with on looking at some options to refinance existing uh, borough debt and hopefully save the borough a fair chunk of money and give us some uh, stability on our um, debt payments going forward. Uh, I worked with them in higher employment and had very successful results with it. So uh, look forward to uh, working with them, working with them again. Great. Well, well, thank you, Samantha. Uh, once again, my name is Chris Bamber from PFM Financial Advisors. Uh, we're hoping to serve as financial advisor to the borough uh, as it relates to some potential upcoming financing plans. Um, in my handout here, um, once again, what we're here tonight to talk about, uh, not necessarily to take any action on, but for discussion purposes only, uh, is a potential refinancing of some of the borough's existing debt, uh, as well as the consideration of what we call new money uh, or additional borrowing for the purposes of funding capital projects. Um, so we'll kind of break it into two pieces, if you will, and I know some of these schedules I think you've seen before with my colleague, Zach Williard. Uh, we have one additional schedule related to the new money stuff we'll talk about. Uh, we're really here just to kind of go over, once again, the timeline, uh, maybe the idea or the concept, as well as any next steps or questions. Um, so just in terms of a first page, uh, you know, we're here because interest rates are low. Uh, they continue to remain low. That chart down towards the bottom kind of illustrates that fact that ever since uh, January of 2020, interest rates have kind of hovered at, at near all-time lows. You see that big spike there was COVID. Um, we've come down since then. And obviously, once again, when we're in the process or in the potential consideration of uh, refinancing existing debt or issuing new debt for capital purposes, we, we like to see a chart like that, if you know what I mean. We like to see when the rates are low. Um, the following page uh, is kind of illustrative of our various topics that we wanted to chat about. Uh, once again, we were uh, contacted to put together some thoughts on some refinancing ideas. And once again, as a municipal advisor or as a financial advisor, our job is to provide independent financial advice to the borough uh, to help with its financing plan. So we're not a bank, we're not an underwriter, uh, we, don't have un we don't have investors or anything like that. Uh, our job is to find those and to lead the borough through that process, uh, typically through an RFP process, which we'll talk about here shortly. 
Um, the, as we talked about, the refinancing component in, in bullet point number two uh, includes the refinancing of the three existing bank loans that are with Customers Bank. Uh, they're eligible to refinance and based on some current numbers, it looks like they are producing some net savings, both based on a uh, cap rate assumption, meaning what happens if rates go to the highest point, as well as with an estimated rate, which is what happens if rates you know, reset to a 10-year average or something like that. Uh, and bullet point number three, once again, what we'll talk about here is also the funding of approximately $1 million for capital projects in, in late 21 or early 22. Uh, in terms of the existing debt there, once again, with the green boxes, um, there are three main components. Um, the average rate or the, the existing rate is 67% uh, of prime for the first one. Uh, the second two are fixed for a little bit longer at 3.5% and 5.25%. Uh, we have some numbers here which show the, the illustrative effects of a refinancing just to show that if you are going to go out and do this, uh, this is what it would look like. Um, that next page right there is simply the, the current um, township, or sorry, the borough's current debt outstanding as it stands right now. And you can see there's, there's four columns in there, but we'd be proposing or we'd be looking to refinance three of them, uh, mainly because those three are the ones that are producing the potential net savings. Um, if we go to the following page, page four, um, page four is really kind of the, the main point here that illustrates uh, the combined impacts of both the refundings. Um, to kind of get a little bit into the detail, the blue section there is a refinancing of the 2014 and 2019 A notes. Those are the tax exempt ones. It'd be about $594,000 of principal. And as you see there in the bottom of column one, what we've done is we've shown uh, the estimated net savings based on if both the existing loan and the new loan go to the max rate, which we show the illustrations there of what we're assuming. Uh, what I think is maybe a new column or an additional column there is column six, which is what happens if we assume that those rates go to their 10-year average. Um, and that you see that even still with that, uh, at least the blue financing or the tax exempt financing produces about $10,200 in net savings. And then if we scroll over to the right, the yellow section here, um, that's the taxable component that refinances the 2019 B note. Uh, that once again is producing savings when we look at a max to max basis of about 121,000. When we use historical averages, it's about 61,000. Um, so the point is, is that when we look at all three of the combined refunding opportunities, um, you know, they're still producing, for, especially for their size, being just over a million dollars combined, um, you know, pretty good savings, especially if you're going to be looking at funding additional capital projects as well. And Chris, maybe another note, this would be a question that's going to come up, but just something that I kind of want to emphasize here, is right now these are variable rate loans, mm -hmm. and it does seem like there would be a realistic opportunity in addition to these savings for the borough to get a fixed rate loan for the um, for the refinancing. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, part of the process will we'll issue an RFP to all the banks that we have uh, association with, a vast majority of them. And what we'll do is we'll ask for a fixed rate for the full term. Uh, but just through our experience and, and, and from, our, from other responses that we've gotten, um, the sweet spot for banks is about 10 to 12 years. Um, the amortization here is a little bit longer than that, but you still will may find a bank that goes out that long. So uh, I think for these purposes, we're assuming maybe fixed for 10 with a reset, but know that during the RFP process, you know, it is our goal to get a fixed rate for the entire term if possible. Uh, but we do want to leave the door open for other proposals because we can get strong proposals via a uh, rate reset mechanism as well. Yeah, that's a great point. I appreciate bringing that up because, uh, again, just in my own home financing, which I know is not mm -hmm. equitable to municipal finance, but variable rates make me nervous. No, nope, yeah, you're absolutely right. That, and that's um, where, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, we're a fixed rate family. So yeah. <laughs> I, I will defer, obviously, to you all as the experts, but I appreciate bringing that up. So um, once again, the, if we kind of think about this financing plan as two components, the first being the refinancing, the second being what we call in our business new money. Uh, and that, what that means is, is borrowing basically an additional million dollars to fund capital projects. Um, I believe, Samantha, is the council, have you seen option one and two, the, the level scenarios? So the full council has not, okay. uh, FNA, this committee, yeah, committee yep. um, the, the last presentation last Got month. Got it, okay. So I, I think these, these two options here, the blue and the yellow, are, are fairly simple in that they're level debt service, the same payment 
uh, more or less year over year as you see in columns six and eight. You know, if you stretch it out over 15 years, it's about $83,000, $84,000 per year as you see in column six. Uh, if you stretch it out over 20 years, it goes lower in annual amount down to about $63,000, $64,000 per year. But obviously you pay more interest expense because you're stretching it out over the life. Um, one additional option, which we're showing here in the red, which uh, many local governments and many boroughs uh, also consider, is what's known as a wrap structure. Um, where basically we take into account the borough's existing debt, meaning that if you look in column five, column five is the borough's existing debt if you did nothing, meaning if you did no new money, if you did no refinancing, that's what it looks like. As you see in column 10, what we're doing is deferring some of the principal amortization up front and effectively having very little principal uh, up front and waiting until your existing debt pays off and then slotting in the principal behind it. Uh, I describe it almost as like a Tetris piece is the way that kind of it fits in my head. But the point is, is from a budgetary perspective, the borough uh, obviously does not have as much of an upfront impact, meaning that when we look at each of these options, co uh, the column on the right is the total debt service budget that the, the borough would have to, you know, for, for source uh, if it were to do each of these options, inclusive of your existing debt as well as your new debt. So you see there that column 11 you know, does produce a fairly small upfront impact without too much extra interest expense. So, um, you know, part of our job as a financial advisor is to explore options like this, to see if it makes sense. And when we see a debt structure that is, you know, like column five, where it's a couple of years higher in the beginning years, we often think about wrap structures. So just wanted to throw that as another consideration of ways of perhaps making this more affordable for the borough uh, as we look at some of the new money considerations. And I think the final page, uh, and I'll pause there for questions or please interrupt if you have any in the meantime, is just kind of like next steps. You know, what, what does this look like going forward? Um, once again, we're here tonight just to discuss things. Uh, what we look for is at the, at the um, borough meeting in November uh, for an authorization to proceed from the financing, for the financing team, which is just simply a motion to say, hey, let's go and proceed with this. Um, we would go and do that competitive bank loan RFP process uh, through the March, through the November time period. Uh, we'd probably get those back in mid to late December, uh, analyze those, uh, and then it would be in mid-December, I believe at the December 15th uh, uh, council meeting is where we would discuss those results and, and potentially select a winning bank. Uh, there would be a, a necessary debt ordinance that a bond council would have to prepare or a lawyer would have to prepare. We're not, we're not one of those, but that would be the official action. That would come in early January uh, or perhaps a special meeting in December, and that would allow us to settle the bond or, or settle the bank loan about 30 days later, call it February, is where we're backing into this. So I know February seems like a long way away, but it is kind of scary yeah. how close yeah. it is. Yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and just so we're clear, I think we talked about this a little bit at the budget uh, work session, but just so the public and everyone's on the same page, uh, the million dollars that we're talking about would be for renovations, primarily for renovations to 100 Conway per the uh, KCDA plan we had done. Uh, infrastructure is scheduled to talk more in detail about that. Um, so, you know, it could be we end up on a different number or something like that, but just based on my kind of current estimate and thought process, that's where uh, PFL got the million dollar number from. Yeah, we could obviously continue to tweak it higher, tweak it lower, you know, up until we really get into that mid-December time point. Um, you know, we just need an estimate and obviously it's up to, to the borough to decide uh, what that final number is. So, uh, you know, a million dollars is a placeholder, if you will. So, uh, pause there for any questions or, or any comments, but I think uh, that's at least what Zach and I chatted about in terms of the financing plan as well as some of the new options that we wanted to chat about. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Fred, can I start with you? Well, uh, I do have some things to say. I mean, first of all, I, I agree that this does seem like a great time to, to refinance and to um, make sure that we've got the capital funds we need for uh, the office building. I mean, you're not, <laughs> the air con among other things, the air conditioning completely died uh, in, in uh, the office building in uh, 100 Conway. So it's one of the many repairs that needs to be made. Um, my concern is primarily the, um, the analysis of the 2014 uh, debt. Um, there's, I mean, I, I've gone back and forth with Samantha about this. There's a lot of interest 
that you're showing in this 2014 debt that I'm not seeing in the amortization schedule. So, I mean, you know, basically we've paid off most of this debt. So we've paid off almost all the interest. The amount of interest remaining is, is fairly small compared to the principal. I mean, that, that's how it is in, in any kind of debt I've seen. And that's how it looks on the, on the amortization schedule. But you're showing like 70,000 uh, in principal, in, in interest remaining on this, on this loan. So I just want to confirm that that number is, is accurate because it, it, from what I could tell, it, it doesn't seem right. Sure, and this is on the uh, the series of 2014 note, the, the small, the, the 100. Yeah, million. the series 2014 note. So you've got, uh, I mean, one thing we talked about before was whether the figure for the fiscal year 2021 is correct. You've got us paying 71,000, you've got us 71,000 remaining to pay in 2021. And I think we've been paying that every month. So I think the actual amount that we have to pay is, is significantly lower than 71,000. No, fair enough. I mean, I think a lot of times what our numbers are based on are based on legal documents that have certain schedules in them. So uh, the underlying schedule I'm seeing here for the 2014 note goes through maturity of September of 24, 2024, um, okay. which it matches, which is on this uh, debt summary thing here. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think that the thing is we're making monthly payments, though. So the amount yes, remaining but, in 2021... And, and I think know that um, you know refunding savings or refunding uh, savings are, are based on interest expense. Interest is principal times rate times time. Of the three refinancing opportunities, I would say this 2014 note is is pulling the least weight out of all of them, given the fact that the two other ones are the longer amortization. Um, so certainly, as we get through the process, and it, if it doesn't make sense for the 2014 note to be included, uh, then certainly we won't. Uh, once again, if we discover that. The majority of it's already been paid off or if there's uh, other factors at play here um, but you know once again no i think that the majority of the refunding savings are most likely being generated uh, from the 2019a and 2019b well i mean the other issue is that in the um in the sort of the conservative assumption which is that the rates stick to the market average there's only ten thousand in savings from refinancing that and that includes what i think is not accurate interest so i think that you know, the, the total might be closer to zero or might be negative <laughs> under that assumption. So I, I, I hesitate to commit to refinancing that right now because I'm, I'm questioning the assumption that's going into it, I guess. I, I, I think that the 2019B makes a lot of sense. I think you've got a full analysis there that seems correct. But the 2019A, uh, I'm, I'm not sold. Anyway, uh, Samantha? Yeah, so, um, yeah, and part of this is definitely uh, my fault, because uh, when, when uh, Fred, when you and I were uh, reviewing, I'm sorry, Councilmember Bush, when you and I were reviewing this together, um, you know, I thought there might have been an issue with the uh, remaining amortization for the 2014 note. I'm looking at the amortization schedule now for that loan, and you are correct that the borough does make monthly payments on it, and you are correct that... Uh, Starting after uh, April of this year, those uh, monthly payments do, uh, you know, the interest does start to drop down on it. Uh, that being said, uh, there is the principal amount is still going to be, let's see, at the end of 2022, there's a um, total payments of about $72,000. And at the end of 2023, there are... Um, Again, payments of about $72,000, including principal and interest, uh, because the bank's amortization schedule was based on the maximum possible rate. And so I think it's good that we had the analysis done of what the 10-year average rate uh, might look like. Uh, but so, um, so yes, the borough has been making monthly payments, but the amount that is listed as being owed um, for that is based on the amortization schedule that we got from the bank and the bank did use an assumption of an interest rate of 5.25 percent um, for uh, 2021 through 2024. Well let, let me let me just ask right now do we need to make a decision on whether we're going to refinance this particular portion of the loan? It sounds like we can separate this out we can get offer I mean do we need to know this right now? 
is the question. Or, uh, or from my perspective, no. I mean, I, and, and, yeah, from my perspective, know. we can continue to refine the analysis as it relates to some of the existing debt to get that amortization schedule right. Uh, because once again, there's kind of the, the two other components or the one other component still make, make sense. So I think from our perspective, you know, we can continue to refine the plan as we go on, uh, even through the, the, the October and November timeframe. So I think that certainly works from our perspective in terms of getting these numbers most accurate with what, you know, the actual amortization is as well as the, uh, you know, as the banks have. So yes, I think is the answer. Okay, so it's the, we can we can continue to work this out. I mean, because I, I don't want to try to try to figure this out right now. Uh, it, but um, okay, I mean, I'm comfortable with the general idea. I'm comfortable with moving this forward. You know, through to to full council. I just this this part of it, this third of it, I think needs more uh, uh, more analysis. Thank you, Bob. Any so questions? If that's issue can be resolved, I'm also comfortable with moving this to council. And that's something you'll just report back to us after you explore it a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and Fred, thanks for um, thanks for taking uh, the deeper uh, dive on yeah. it because you're really good questions and thoughts. Always. Um, any other questions and comments for us, Chris? No, no, absolutely. Once again, okay. just kind of here to, to provide an update and happy to answer any other um, questions. There's one item Chris noted as well that I did want to bring to everyone's attention. So uh, bond council. Uh, if we do move forward, uh, I did speak with the borough solicitor about it, and his office would not serve as bond council for this. Um, they felt it would be a little bit of a uh, conflict for them to be the borough solicitor and serve as the bond council on this. So I did reach out to a law firm that I worked with in the past and that he had been on his work with uh, successfully in the past to serve as bond counsel. I received this afternoon an engagement letter uh, from them um, so for the next um, F&A meeting, I can provide that Great. engagement letter for uh, F&A and then for a council to consider. Great, thank you. Let me just... I have one more question if we can, uh, if I can refer it now. Um, do your, does your analysis include, it looks like typically it costs about 5% to issue a bond or that that's like what it costs to, to get it going, you know, not including the interest. Does your analysis include that? Like the cost of issuance. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, there are some assumed cost of issuance uh, included in these numbers, both for the refinancing component as well as the new money component. And that would include the cost of bond counsel, the cost of financial advisor, the cost of any uh, bank counsel that there may be that the bank has. Um, that, you know, we'll provide a full list of this as we continue to refine it. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 some estimates or at least you know, rough estimates are included in these numbers. So they are net of these numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. We appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. Coming up. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Nice to see people in real life. Um, Thank you. Okay, thanks. So let's move back to then um, 4.1, the Comprehensive Plan and Implementation Review. Um, and that data, I wanted to wait for you, Bob, um, to be here for that. And then that should tee us up in perfect timing for the Business Disbursement Ordinance um, when John Walker calls at 7-ish. That sounds great. Okay. Um, so as you all know, we sent out the review that Michelle created in our comprehensive plan, really per that plan's call to say we should evaluate where we've gone and where we need to be. And um, all of council individually made that assessment and Michelle has compiled that data um, to allow us to look at how we all collectively um, assess this individual pieces. And it was fascinating to see where we were in our perspectives. So I will turn it over to let you present that. Um, and just as a reminder to council and the public that our hope is then to plan kind of a town hall to review this. And I think that really coordinates, coincides very nicely rather with the budget because it's an opportunity to say, this is where we've assessed where we are, this is how we're addressing those needs in the budget. Um, and an opportunity to really see the conversations come to fruition, you know, amongst all three council committees. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to you both again. Uh, yeah, I think that is, is a really great way to describe it, uh, council member records. And as uh, council may have noticed in the budget presentation uh, a couple weeks ago, I tried to tie budget requests to the comprehensive plan. So I think it's all really flowing um, together the way that a comprehensive plan should. Uh, also, I thank some members of council who took the time to uh, you know fill this survey out. And also, of course, my thanks to uh, Michelle Carroll for uh, putting the survey together. 
Um, so the survey results you have here are the ones that uh, Microsoft forms and just generate on its own. If there's any deeper detail that we want to get into with it, um, you know, it's just a matter of staff finding time to really work through that. Um, so as you can see here, I mean, there were six responses. I'm just going to talk in general about what the results look like. So for each item, you have the question shown, uh, and then you have what the possible responses were, and then it shows what the results were. Um, I will admit my nitpick with Microsoft Forms is I wish it told us how many people did each response. Uh, I think we can kind of guess, looking at the size of the bars, that like for this first question, you know, one person put zero, and then either four or five people uh, put, you know, put in progress for that first item. Um, I can't always tell as well on each question how many people answered it, because um, it wasn't required for someone to answer every question. And I think we encouraged council members who weren't knowledgeable on an item not to answer <laughs> a question. So, um, and then finally, the results were anonymous. Um, the other thing I'll note about the way the results are presented from Microsoft Forms is we did have, at the end of each uh, section, uh, an opportunity for uh, qualitative data. And it unfortunately just takes the first snippet of the qualitative data without providing the full uh, response. So we'd have to, uh, you know, dig through the data to pull those responses out. Can we do that? Is, so we can still access that. We just have to go in individually. Yeah. So I mean, um, it did provide, which I did originally send to the group, was the actual like raw data right. from it. But uh, obviously, that data needs some. Um, it doesn't include the questions on it. So um, there had to be a little bit of work done to that spreadsheet to make it something useful as an evaluated tool. If that's something that you want the office to do, or is that something FNA can volunteer to <laughs> so, go down and do emergent teams from answers? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. If, if, uh, if anyone from FNA is able to help out with that, I don't think yeah. the office would mind one bit, and we'd be grateful for that system. So just going in and mining the comments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. matching them up with what question they went with, yeah. Um, yeah, I would love to do I'm that. I'm happy to do it. Yeah, because I, I don't even think, I mean, I think we can match up to the question, but I think we're going to find some real emergent themes from yeah. just council comments that we can use to inform. That's great. Yeah, let's. And I, I have to say, like, well, I don't know if you want comments yet. But, no, please, go ahead. You know, I was a skeptic initially about the, the importance of doing this kind of survey and evaluation, but it really won me over to see the results. And to see to see it all in one place, and I and I think it's incredibly useful to do at some kind of regular interval, um, maybe annually, and um, I think I, I look forward to future conversations about what we learned from it. And there were some surprise, there were a few surprises there, and interesting uh, contrasts yeah. in terms of people's the council members' perceptions of where projects were. And I think to some of us, something that seemed like it was in progress seemed like it was not being thought about at all to some. And other people, had, on some of the items, thought they were complete. Yeah. And I think that really has to do with diff various council members' perception of what role the government has in dealing with issues, what role the private sector or some of our community organizations have in deal doing some of those items and fulfilling some of the comprehensive plan agenda items, and what role um, you know, what, things that we even our perception of what's already, say, available in, in, the, in the world. Like, there's certain data and there's certain information that's just available through Google or YouTube that actually is the clearinghouse for information that maybe we're asking the government to provide, but it's already there if you know how to look for it. And what we maybe need are just some pointers. So that's, that's something I wanted to share yeah. like, from it. I think following up on that point from uh, Councilmember Weissboard is that um, I think some of it too may come down to how how well uh, the staff is informing council about what's going on as well, and that's something that's really important to me is making sure that uh, council and the public, you know, I mean, doesn't even know every last little thing we're doing every day for our office, but for these and things that are important on being a comprehensive plan, I really want to make sure that all of borough council is on an even information level about this task. Okay. Um, Fred? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, mean, I, 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 I do have concerns about the areas where people, <laughs> we have widely different opinions about, about where we are. So uh, Samantha, if you know, you know, if you see something in there and it's clear that, oh yeah, we've done this or, oh, well, we're really not doing it, you know, it might be an opportunity to inform council. Um, I went ahead and took a look at some of the, the high and medium items and, and what, what I thought the consensus was. So, you know, I was pleased to see some of the, some of the things that are basically completed. We've got encourage mixed use development in the downtown district, develop a climate action plan, partner with local groups for bike education and resources, <laughs> develop policies and regulations to incentivize the preservation and appropriate alteration of historic properties. These should all, uh, should all ring a bell. These are things we've you know, basically uh, <laughs> accomplished or, or done a lot for in the last few years. Um, and then just looking at some of the things where everybody is, uh, everybody agrees that we haven't done much. So <laughs> room for, room for uh, um, improvement. And I do wonder, agreed. I do wonder that when we look through the qualitative data and kind of look for themes, emerging themes, as well is that we could even kind of take a deeper dive into this too and really highlight those where there is a real disconnect with council as well kind of put that on our radar i found this helpful even in just going through the process of revisiting the comprehensive plan i mean i know that we, we're so often now i love that we're strategically mapping grants and budget to the comprehensive plan but after going through this there was a lot that i just hadn't really to be honest thought of because we haven't kind of proactively looked at. So it just served as a good reminder of where we should be going. And perhaps we can identify some of that too, Bob, um, when we bring that to council and then the community. Yeah, those are important to discuss where uh -huh. there's divergence. And maybe we discuss those in the committee first. Yeah. Sunday, and and, and then I can bring those out for next time if you want. Yeah, I think that would be helpful is to, to analyze this a little bit within the committee too and then bring it to the council. And also, I do wonder, you know, looking at some of the economic development, for example, or the, the bike is another great example where we should actually, let's use the bike in the biking kind of infrastructure uh, and community education programs. I mean, really, that was very largely driven by the Narborough Cycling Club and the partnerships and the relationships there. So when we look at things like the economic development phase, we can also plug in where we should further develop some of those public-private partnerships and allow um, community volunteers and orgs to kind of help us achieve those goals. It doesn't all have to be from the office. True, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about Barbara Fur that I've come to um, appreciate in just uh, a little under five months here is the wealth of community spirit and the wealth of you know community desire to make the town a better place. So if I, if I can make a suggestion for going forward, what, what I would like to do is, is to pick like a cluster, pick a, pick a few that are, that I think are interconnected goals. For me, it, it's, it's sidewalks. We've got a lot of sidewalk stuff here. We're working on some sidewalk stuff uh, in infrastructure. Um, pick, pick several of these things and sort of, I don't know what the forum would be, to, but to, to have that as sort of an area of emphasis for next year, maybe, or next couple of years. And maybe every council member can pick an area that they think, you know, they, they really want to support and that's in here and that we all agree is uh, needs more work and then just work to bring that forward over the next year. Sure. And so just to tag on there, Fred, I think that's a great idea. And I think it naturally, we could sort these according to committee structures. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and just to, rather than have the F&A committee discuss them, have them discussed in each committee. So, so naturally you would be looking at the sidewalks. Right. Um, and those policies and, and, and you know, and health, you know, public safety, health and public safety would be looking at, say, the shade tree issues. Right. So just, I guess, a legal question or an operational question. If we wanted to get together just to data mine, organize, come up with those clusters and kind of assign committees, could we do that outside of advertising? In other words, I'd hate to take up an hour and a half to do this. I more envision us getting lunch, spending a couple hours with... <laughs> Papers all over. I mean, I'm not at all, you know, so as it's, it's, a work, it's a work session. If it's, if say, it's not deliberating on anything. So I think you'd be better off just advertising it. And if you can fit something during the day or something, so be it. Um, but I think it would be a lot safer just to advertise it and have it open to the public. 
And sure. someone from the public wants to come and spend, you know, a couple hours at the borough office during the day watching council do that, then you know, okay. so be it. Sure. And I'd almost envision a part two if we identified community organizations that well we have to let's do the, let's do part one first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part one first. It. Okay. So let's. I'll yeah. send out a doodle poll, Fred, where the three of us can see is there a time that we could take this over and organize. We'll advertise that in case folks want to come. Um, oh, you're talking about just the three members of this committee. Yeah. Oh no, no, you wouldn't have that. I mean, we probably still should. You wouldn't have to because it's not a formal council. But um, I'd say it should be on the safe side. We'll we'll advertise it. Okay. So why don't I send up a, a doodle poll for the three of us? Okay. That one we can just sit and do this. I like the idea of having snacks at lunch. I'm totally down with snacks. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so with that, I do want to give time. Is is John on yet? Um, uh, let's see here. I don't think so. I think we are a couple minutes uh, shy. Okay. okay, can I maybe tee this up? And then um, when John joins us, he can oh, answer yeah, absolutely. any specific questions. Um, so I, I put on this ordinance, and I apologize if it really is coming out of nowhere, um, but I, I kind of fell into this um, in a conversation with Mr. Walco. There is a disbursement ordinance available for downtowns, and there are some examples of that in Cheltenham and in Upper Darby Township, where essentially you would create an ordinance to say, um, and I'll give an example in Cheltenham that um, there should be, I'll read it, the, the no tobacco store or smoke shop um, shall be located no closer than 500 feet from any other tobacco store or smoke shop. Um, there's one in Upper Darby that looks like nail salons, for example. So the question um, really becomes, is this something that we would want to consider, and particularly given the fact that we do have construction and revitalization downtown, if we were to consider, again, not regulating who could come in, because it's not a government's job to say, yes, you store, no, you store, we like coffee, we don't like tea. I mean, that's government overreach. However, we could use a disbursement ordinance to say, limit the quantity of certain particular types or, or areas of shops. The examples here, again, are smoke shops, tobacco, nail salons, hair salons, um, in, in the ordinance that um, John prepared for us. Um, so really, I guess it's, I'm starting with this consideration, is this something that we want to even entertain, do a little research, and bring it to council? It's, it's the discussions being, a discussion like that took place at length, oh, five, well, 12 years ago, <laughs> and among planning commission members. And I wonder if it has it come up any more recently among planning commission members? No. But it, it was it was a part when the, so the, all along the way, the planning commission spends time reviewing the zoning code, like both sort of retrospectively and perspective, like perspectively. And, and um, when the during discussions in say like 2010 around the new thoughts around the new zoning code, there was discussion about kind of limiting the number of shops you could have in proximity to one another. That's what you're talking about, yeah. right? like putting some kind of minimum sure. distance between. Yep. And I think, I, I don't know that I can summarize completely like sort of the, the consensus of that time, but I feel like at this time, um, there, there's, a, there's sort of some wisdom to just allowing the marketplace to determine the distribution of stores. Agreed. And so, yeah, so that means sometimes you have three dry cleaners kind of all on the same block. But on the other hand, if there's commerce there's enough for three dry cleaners, well, then you've got, you know, that's bringing people into town to get their dry cleaning done Agreed. and doing other things while they're here. But, and you know, so, it's funny you say dry cleaners because so many neighbors have always said, why do we have so many dry cleaners? And my answer is always because we have that many shirts. Yeah. Um, you know, that you really do let the, the invisible hand in the free market. Um, so, and I, so I absolutely appreciate that. And I do think if we were to even consider this, we would want a lot of public comment. The other concern is that I do, that I question I have for John Walco too is, you know, if there's a question between another dry cleaner two stores down from a, versus a vacant store, I do think that, you know, I'd like to understand what the clauses are where you can file for an exception. 
a business pro or property owner could file for an exemption or a waiver for that. Because again, I think vacant storefronts are the biggest fear in a vibrant downtown. In some ways, I'd want to see if we have pursued the discussion about having a downtown manager or somebody in a role that's looking at kind of like what's going to optimize the mix for all of the re retailers who are already there and how to support, say, the cultivation of tenants and, and, and maybe working with the property owners to, to compensate that person but, or to, to build that, whatever that structure is, because yeah. um, everybody benefits. It's not just... Not just the, not just the, um, tech, not just the taxpayers, but you know the consumers benefit because they have more things they can get there. And the property owners benefit because they have tenants. Town benefits, but I think it would be we should put our some energy into that, and then maybe have that discussion with that person about is there any wisdom to having restrictions on how many of a certain type of thing can you have? Sure. Before I comment, why don't I get. Any questions or comments from you? Yeah, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of picking which businesses go where. It's It doesn't, I. I I'm sorry, you are or not? I'm, I'm, not, I'm uncomfortable. It, 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 oh, okay. I, I, don't, I don't like the, I don't really like the idea of council um, trying to determine which businesses, which, which sorts of businesses can, I mean, I, I think, you know, if we want to, you know, you know we, we have rules that say you have to be a, a a service business or a, you know, I mean, there, there are only certain uses that can go into the downtown shops, right? But those are broad definitions and we're, I, I, I'm not comfortable, I guess, is, is where I am. I, I don't like the idea of, of picking, you know, <laughs> winners and losers among stores. So. Okay. So I do think that though, this is uh, kind of a line that we try to dance, which is, I think, unique to Narberth, perhaps, in that, we ask, Hi, can we ask you to put a mask on, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, is that, you know, we want to support a vibrant downtown um, and we want to facilitate how we can support our Narberth Business Association and recognizing that there's a social ecosystem within our downtown that we have really intentionally supported um, and we will again in that budget. So, I, I mean, if, I, if the two of you are saying you don't want to move it forward um, into full council, I mean, I'm going to respect that. I think there's some merit to actually talking through it with the NBA, uh, with the Narberth Business Association to say, will this help you to have a diversified neighbors, business neighbors? Um, I would be comfortable with it. Ask. I'm hesitant to put anything else in the Narberth Planning Commission, but... Um, you know, taking feedback from neighbors in coordination with the Narvis Business Association. But if you are too aren't comfortable there, I will, I will end the discussion. Um, I'd be, I'd be more comfortable with having the the, 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 excuse me, the planning commission take it up than having the business association. Although it's nice, be nice to know their opinion. But yeah, their opinion. But, yeah. But yeah. I guess I, I am aligned with the idea of just allowing, allowing the marketplace to determine okay. what works. Okay, and Fred, that's your opinion too? Well, I mean, if the NBA comes back and says we really want this, then you know, I'll look at it. But, uh, I mean, I'm willing to, to listen if there's demand for this, but it, it makes me uncomfortable. I, will say. I, think, I think we'd also want to include with the NBA the, the property owners themselves, because it's really, sure, you know, it's, that's their, they have the largest stake in it. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, so I think. Um, I think you mentioned something earlier, uh, Councilman Weisberg, that was really interesting to me was, and I, if, if maybe we can open up the discussion, I'll, I'll leave it up to your discretion, uh, Councilman Records. Um, the discussion of a downtown manager, like, that's the sort of thing that I would love myself, honestly, to be a little uh, selfish, would love to have more time to do, but I also recognize that's not like, maybe not the best use of my time. Uh, I don't know if the borough has ever talked about in detail hiring a downtown manager who would do all those things that um, you know that Bob just said. Um, you know, I worked with one uh, in my last job for five years, and that's it's like basically exactly those tasks that uh, that were listed is what that person did. So I'm glad you brought this up because we should publicly kind of almost do a recap of where we have um, gone, and I'm happy to do that in a couple of minutes. 
Um, so gosh, I guess about five years ago, six years ago now, we brought in Donna Harris to look who really uh, manages that Main Street management model where you have almost a part-time person that comes in and creates events, who um, has relationships with businesses, who serves as a liaison between the businesses and the borough. And really, when we looked at that, she did it. We have a report. I think it was $750. So I wasn't actually on council yet, but I think I might have been um, awaiting my seat. Um, you know, what kind of businesses we would like. And, you know, everybody said we loved at that point our anchor institutions. We valued the pharmacy, that Brooklyn's, obviously the family market, um, and that these were stores that we hoped to retain. So she, for a small fee, kind of did this really well attended town hall, collected that data, and said, okay, this is what a Main Street management corridor could do. And, you know, the results were we actually have a lot of this stuff. You know, we have a relationship with the businesses where owners and the NBA come to us and they run events. We don't actually have to hire somebody for that need. We're not a community starting out at square one. So that didn't feel like a match. We talked to, I spent, gosh, Aaron and I explored kind of business improvement district managers because those are folks that really do more of that retail recruitment, which is what we're talking about and it's different than a Main Street manager. So we put earmarked money into the NBA because they have really served as that role as that kind of de facto Main Street manager. What does appear to be missing is that retail recruiter um, that can help property owners identify these are stores and businesses that can come into a small town with the understanding that it is a social ecosystem. So Bob, you know, one, one store success is your neighbor's store success as well as Drew will say, you know what, I love the dry cleaners because people stop for a six pack of beer when they're walking back to their house, right? They support one another. When we talk to retail recruiters, I mean, they are, that's a six figure position of bringing somebody in to help identify. Um, prior to the pandemic, I actually coordinated a meeting with um, Bob Keegan, who is the developer at 114 yeah. Forest, and Tim Rubin, who is doing the Haverford Avenue. And they met with business association members and really um, articulated, you know, our amenity is the Narberth downtown, right? So our, our apartments don't have gyms, we don't have pools. What we have to offer is a train and a thriving downtown. So it behooves us to invest in this town. Um, and I think business owners were really happy at that meeting to understand that. I actually just reached back out <laughs> to Mr. Rubin to say, hey, now that um, stuff is moving and we're out of at least lockdown in the pandemic, would you want to revisit some conversations um, with the business association? So I do wonder if now that we're seeing really some real life construction that we should, we should open up that conversation again and help the business association facilitate what is the plan. So yeah, I, Cindy, I think you've got it exactly right. Like I think, I think you're, you're pursuing it in the way that makes sense to me. You've got, we have an existing business association Right, which is the community of shop owners and business people within the borough. And then we have a community of property owners who you're talking to. Some of them are really big property owners who are going to spend a lot of money on marketing, on, re on marketing their retail spaces once they're built, and who have an investment in keeping the town really nice because they have a lot of tenants right. who are living here and they want to keep the town nice for their tenants. And if they're, I, I wonder, like, what's the role for the government in in supporting them in having a productive relationship. Is there a role? I'm not sure. You know, it's like when we had that meeting with the downtown manager who presented the presentation about mostly like communities that had been somewhat blighted, Absolutely. main streets that were blighted, like their big concerns were like, how do we get the police involved right. in like patrolling this yeah. business corridor regularly? Yeah. Yeah. How do we get the lighting improved? Right. And can we get the trash picked up? And yeah. How do we get the trash picked yeah. up? Yeah. It was like the big concerns that require a Main Street manager were really like things that we've got totally in hand. Like we have really nice flower planters. Right. They were like, that, those were huge wins for those communities if they could have flower planters right. that were being cared for. By, right. by we were, the, but we have all of that. Like the, the one area is exactly what you're putting your, 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 your you know, you've got it on the nose, I think. But, but I think we really need to think about how do we as a council or as a government body support 
the cultivation of that relationship and help them make it really meaningful and productive. Right. And if it means that we can that we could say support the business association with some money for a role for for a, for a recruiter, a district manager, that's great. I mean, we probably don't need a full time district manager because we're small. Right. But maybe there's a way in which maybe there's a firm or something that maybe we could help identify. Right. The kind of the right. Um, right. Contractor. And you know, I, I have to add to this too. Um, you know, I do, to your question of what is the government's role, because I do think that's a really important question, and we have to be really careful of where the government, um, you know, inserts itself in private business, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is why I think it's what we've done. I'm so comfortable with is that the government is giving money to the Narvik Business Association with earmarked funds on how mm -hmm. to utilize for economic development. That points back to our comprehensive mm -hmm. plan, so it does feel um, strategic on our end. I also think that we can help facilitate and support. What do public-private partnerships look like, which we have, um, which is what Main Street, to your point, kind of brings, but we are really mm -hmm. farther down that line. Mm -hmm. um, another example of what I think makes Narva so special is that we do have a resident who came forward and said, hey, I did this as a career, I'm retired, I'm really interested in how I can support a little bit more. Um, I just met with this community member who said, here's what I can offer, here's what I do. Um, hey, I just talked to him this evening, actually. I actually have this content that is a journalist that does this. How can I plug in? So if council is almost the connector, mm -hmm. you know, where I said, okay, this is great. Let's connect you with the Narberth Business Association mm -hmm. as a resource because you're really looking for a volunteer opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. And that might be one of our roles, too. Manager Brian, are you familiar with communities anywhere, you know, say, southeastern Pennsylvania that do this well? Where they kind of get the relationships right, and because it seems like it's a moving, it's like a moving train all the time. You know, like I mean, I watch. You know, you watch Maniac rise and fall all the time. It's like it's like booming bus. <laughs> Absolutely, and, uh, that's a know? great example. And, yeah, it's. And no, it's I, think, I mean, having you know, personally having lived in uh, Landsale Borough and Doylestown Borough and Phoenixville Borough in the past, mm -hmm. I mean, I think those are three towns. Just as a resident. That seemed to really get it right, and just mm -hmm. you know the interactions I've had with their management as, as being part of my job um, seem like they have really good people there. You know who know what they're doing. So I mean, I'd be happy to reach out, you know, to the folks at sure. Mansell, Doylestown, and uh, Phoenixville to find out how they sort of deal with these sort of things. So and the cabinet, they're all a little bigger than us, mm -hmm. but and off the top of your head, you're not, the structure isn't, you're not sure how they do it. I think that's a lot like what we're talking about here in Narver, uh -huh. where, um, you know, all three of those towns, well, I know in Lansdale and um, Doylestown, there's a, um, there's a group very similar to the NDA in each right. of those respective towns, and uh, the municipality uh, mm -hmm. contribute support to those organizations. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ambler is another great example. That's true, yeah. And, you know, Bob, to your question of what the government's role is, I actually think the greatest thing that we've done to support our businesses, and I say this because business owners have told me, is the density around the train. Mm -hmm. Foot traffic. Yeah. What yeah. do they need people? And this was pre-pandemic, before people's shopping habits yeah. and patterns changed. And you're saying, and foot traffic? Just, I just want to be clear, like, I'm not asking what's the government's role. I think we clearly have a role in providing security, good lighting, Absolutely. picking up the trash, having, making the planters, contributing to the NBA, right. all those things that most of those communities long for, we're already right. providing. They have to hire it's, someone to get there. Yeah, I guess it's when it comes to, like, say, the borough district manager, the recruiting, the recruitment of, say, appropriate businesses to fill those vacancies. Like, is that... Like, I guess I don't know that it's our lane as a government to provide that service, per se, right. but to support the provision for it makes sense to me, as long as it's sort of being managed by the businesses and the property owners who have the most sort of skin in the game. Right. And I think, I, and I additionally, I think that, that the big property owners probably ought to pay, you know, participate in paying for it. Sure, because it's there. Because so much to gain. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. theirs to, for sure, absolutely. And maybe that's a conversation we could help the business association have, since we already do have, like, the municipality it does have a relationship with them, since they absolutely. depend so much on, on the borough for services. Absolutely. And we were the convener last time of the NARVA, the NBA, the NARVA Business Association, and the two um, developers of property on Haverford and Forest, and we can include Montgomery now um, as well as they think about that retail. So can we say like 
will say disbursement that there's not a movement towards exploring this more at this time, but this at the back shelf, and that um, you know maybe we even want to reconvene an ad hoc, much like there is the parking study. And I think this is really important to say: like, parking is not a problem. We have the data. <laughs> Uh, parking is not the issue, um, but I think the example of parking is there is a thread into each of the committees in F&A and infrastructure and public safety that has to look at the issue of parking. Perhaps we identify economic development downtown as almost like an ad hoc committee where we have, we convene a formal subcommittee that understands, to your point, like how does economic development depend on policing and public health and safety? or shade tree, or plantings, okay, infrastructure, um, mm -hmm. you know, what's your piece, or, or we intentionally put it on each committee's radar to see how does your committee contribute to the economic development of downtown. Mm -hmm. It's like another in your series. I'm sorry, uh, Cindy, I, I'm oh, just going to have to go, sorry. I'm going to try to make the meeting. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Meeting, so, uh, yeah, uh, well, okay. Cut out if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Are you fine. coming down here? For yeah, and we can finish this up. So yeah, we'll okay. I'm going to call first. Do you need? Do you need? I mean, we're going to have any votes? Do you want? No, 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 no votes. Well, is that it? Yeah, yeah, okay. that's it. We'll I'll see. Just, I'll see you in a few minutes. Really. See you soon. Okay. Is he coming here? Is yeah, he? he's coming. So, so um, just it's almost like um, it's another in this Rickard series of lunch and learns. Um, <laughs> like you know, it's another. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm just laughs> <gonna, laughs> I can see your reaction in your mouth. <laughs> Do whatever. <you> <laughs> Yeah, no, I like, I like the sound of that. Cindy's so gonna come meet with them, oh. you know. <laughs> but like special projects that where where like if we burn up some intellectual calories, like thinking together and yeah. and uh, plant, you know, we could actually distill this down into something that's very effective way to move forward. Yeah, I think yeah. we should try to revisit that. And I'd love to ask us to pause this conversation here. I'll connect with our business association. And Ed, um, reach out to Bob and Tim that we've had conversation with, and invite them to maybe all come together and we can. But let's do it as right. Manager Bryant suggested, like as a kind of a public thing. Sure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like, maybe it's at lunchtime in a, in a work day. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, in the evening or but or a weekend. Great. Just sometime during a work day where we can have a kind of working session. Yeah. But still have it be public. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. I think I, I think we're maybe a little too time pressed at the moment. Yeah, to like, yeah. Yes. Okay. it might be well, 2020, 2022, yeah. right? It's, yeah. I think we're talking about 2022 somewhere down the. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, last time we actually met at the Get Cafe, it was a Norbert Business Association. Again, my role was just kind of get to give the introduction, and there was really fruitful conversations about you know uh, place based art uh, and how the businesses. Could again have that symbiotic relationship with developers. So maybe we can discuss that. Take the owl on the road. Yeah. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Have owl will travel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, with that, let's adjourn and we'll give us a couple um, minutes to stretch. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Do you um, have, have any public comment? I'm so sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry. okay. Sorry. Then I will adjourn. Mm -hmm. I, I, no I was thinking it was a workshop. No. Or something.